what is a miracle? Uh, defined by Dr. Norman Geisler, uh, a miracle uh, in his book, When Skeptics Ask, is a miracle is a divine intervention into or an interruption of the regular course of, world, of the world that produces a purposeful but unusual event that would not have occurred otherwise. Do you agree? I do. Do you think a miracle is going to occur here today in Psalm 119 uh, that I will cover 176 verses in 30 minutes? Uh, probably not. I was thinking about it this week. I'm like, how in the world? Uh, and th anyway, so uh, that's not going to happen. You're not going to see a divine interruption of normal exegetical events. And we cover this thing and you walk out here going, whoa, that was awesome. Uh, we may go into this passage and never come out in your lifetime. So... Um, <laughs> Anyway, so uh, what I want to try to do, and don't hold me to this, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to attempt to cover this in two Sundays. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm already getting a wow up here. Y'all, I want to see that. Like, why do you come to church? Just to see if you can do it now. Yeah. So um, anyway, so uh, two sermons, maybe three, but I'm, I'm going to try for two. Uh, I, I've studied the whole psalm out in detail uh, to really understand where I want to go with it. So uh, a couple of things I want to say uh, as we prepare to study this, I have to do some groundwork because of the length of the passage. Um, so like why two sermons? Why not 20 sermons? Uh, well, two, two ideas. Number one, uh, the main theme of the psalm, as you're going to see, deals with um, what you as a believer do when you are uh, uh, harassed by the world, the hostile world for your faith wherever you are, whether it's a husband who's not saved or you work in an office where they're hostile to Christians, whatever it is, uh, how do you function in a way that advances the kingdom of God? I mean, how do you live in a hostile environment as a Christian? Um, I think that'll preach all day long in the culture in which we live. Um, and so uh, since there are 22, what would be 22, uh, what we would call pericopes or 22 uh, paragraphs in this passage, that would be 22 sermons on the same motif. Are you prepared for that? I would surmise, uh, just being practical, that if I were to do 22 sermons on that same motif, after about two sermons, you'd be thinking, I think I got it. All right? So I'm going to tell you up front, uh, there's 22 individual little motifs on the same concept of how Christians should live in a hostile world. When the world hates you, how do you function? Uh, so I'm going to give you maybe two, maybe three Sundays on that motif to prepare you for wherever God has placed you. Uh, and then the rest of that, uh, you'll be on your own to, to study. Uh, which uh, leads to my second point. Why only two to three sermons on this? Well, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, which is uh, my life verse, says this, Be diligent to, pre uh, to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not be, need to be ashamed, handling correctly the word of truth. So be a student of the word of God. I mean, I, that's been my life verse since I was a, a teenager. Uh, to be a student in the word that when you stand before God, he can say, you studied well and you lived well in light of what I, I said to you. So uh, I submit that to you to say you too are to be diligent in your study of the Word of God. Uh, so it has never been my goal as we've gone through all of the Psalms to cover every single Psalm because many of them deal with the same concepts. So I've covered some, those concepts, but not every single chapter because that would be too repetitive. Uh, and uh, I leave the other for you to understand and, and dig into yourself. Uh, so I submit to you Psalm 119. What, the verses we don't cover, don't freak out and go, oh, wait, man, go back to the... I'm not coming back to the ones I'm passing over, okay? Uh, and so those will be for you to study. Uh, as a side note, Psalm 119 is an acrostic. So an ac uh, acrostic, um, uh, it means that um, the, the first letter, and they, and they devise them differently, but uh, in this particular passage, the ninth verse of every, uh, every movement uh, begins with an alphabetical letter of Hebrew. Uh, so there's uh, Aleph, the first letter uh, is uh, A. Uh, it, so there's, there's Aleph in verse 1, uh, and then there's eight verses, and then the ninth verse is Bait, the, like B, and then there's eight verses, and the, nine, nine, and there's nine, and the ninth verse is then Gimel. And so it does that throughout the entire psalm. So it's very structured and very organized. Um, so uh, it's a great way uh, to learn the Hebrew alphabet if you don't know it. You, are you ready? Yeah. So don't worry, I won't do it in Hebrew, but, uh, but that's how it is structured. So you see in Hebrew completely uh, uh, flat out. Uh, so what is the purpose of an acrostic? Um, number one, uh, and we call this a authorial intent. Why, why did the author spend his time structuring in this way? Uh, for one, uh, this indicates that God is going to talk about how to handle a hostile environment as a Christian uh, from every perspective you can imagine, from A to Z, as it were. 
you follow, and, not, and that's just using the English alphabet from, you know, from the Hebrew Aleph, you know, uh, to the end of the alphabet, which is Tav, T. Um, he's going to cover everything you ever wanted to know. So I don't know where you are, if you're at the Pentagon, you're at the White House, uh, if you're a school teacher in a tough environment, uh, and you want to know, how do, I, how do I function in this environment uh, to God's glory? Because we have many great Christians implanted throughout uh, wonderful places throughout our, our great, great country doing great things for God. But it's, but it's tough, isn't it? And so how do I function? So this is going to show you how to do it. Uh, number two, the acrostic makes a memorization easy. Because imagine they didn't have Bibles back then. They couldn't bring them to church. It wasn't on their iPhone. They didn't have an iPhone. But, but they had limitations. So they had to, they had to memorize the scripture. So uh, it made it easier to memorize this if you were uh, like uh, teaching your children. So you teach your children, like my grandchildren are learning the ABCs and they sing the little song. You know the song? Yeah, you all, you, how many know that song? See this? See? Yeah, you remember it? We could all sing it right now, couldn't we? Uh, this is the same thing with Psalm 119. So they could start a little child light uh, off on Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalit, Hey, Vav, Zion, Hey, Tate, Yod, Kof. They could go through the whole alphabet and the little kid could know, oh, I know what Vav means. Or I know what MAME means, the alphabets. And so they would teach their children, their children, how to live for God in an environment that's going to be against them. Isn't that interesting? And that's a whole other sermon. Are you teaching your children how to live in an environment that will oppose the Word of God and the law of God? Uh, now, with that background information, I want to give you one more thing before we actually get into Psalm 119. John 15 sets the tone for Psalm 119. Uh, listen to what Jesus said to us and take note of it. He says, this I command you, that you love one another. Speaking of Christian to Christian, do you love one another? Uh, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it has hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember that, the, that I said unto you, a slave, that's you as a Christian, is not greater than his master, i.e. Jesus. If, so he's arguing, you know, the motif from the lesser to the greater. Uh, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for, who, for what reason? For Christ's sake, his name's sake. Because they do not know the one who sent me. So once you identify yourself as a believer by faith, uh, John 5, 24 uh, through 25, you come to Christ by faith uh, and embrace him as your savior and the redeemer, um, you have just set yourself against the world. The world will then come after you uh, because you now are not one of them. You are for light and you are not for the darkness anymore. Uh, and so Jesus said, if they hated me, and they, and they did, well, then you can bang on the fact that they're not, they're not going to be excited about you. Why? Well, why did they hate Jesus? Uh, that's a whole other sermon series in and of itself, but a couple ideas that we can bring to the forefront. Number one, Jesus spoke truth. That's why they didn't like him. He spoke truth. They hate truth because truth destroys their vacuous system, whatever it is, whether it's religious system, uh, political system, it, truth destroys said system. So they hate truth speakers. Uh, number two, Jesus, they hated him because he called sin, sin. Sin to Jesus was sin. It didn't matter what the culture said. What was sin in the Old Testament was still sin in the New Testament times. Uh, sin transcends uh, all time and it never changes. Sin is always sin. And so Jesus called sin, sin. Um, they hate him because of that. So he started out his ministry by clearing the temple because of sin, greed with the money changers. And he closes his ministry the last week before he was crucified, clearing the temple a second time. They hated him because of that. They hated him. So if they hated your Lord, they're going to hate you. So if you became a Christian so you could be the popular person in the room, what's the word? Well, even though you might be very likable and very nice, etc., you just start pe speaking up on different topics and all of a sudden, they will circle the wagons, and they will not be for you. So this particular uh, uh, psalmist, uh, we don't know who it was exactly, um, he must have been a high-profile person, like a political person. Why? Because when you read through this passage, his main opponents were Israelite politicians. So this is a psalm for D.C., is it not? Uh, this is a Christian working in a political environment, and the princes and the kings, if you read the passage, hate him. Why? He's for truth, and he calls sin, sin. And they, they can't stand that. So he's a threat to their power base, and they're always looking for ways to silence him or sideline him, uh, and we can learn much from him. So with those preparatory things in mind, uh, we want to look at the main motif of the passage, which is how can you as a Christian stand strong and true in tough times? 
And these are tough times. And if you don't know they're tough times, I'll give you some ideas why they're tough times. Um, you're a school teacher, uh, and you, wanna, you want to teach about uh, racial, racial reconciliation, because this is a Christian thing, correct? We are to love one another, correct? Jesus, we just read Jesus' words. We are to love one another. doesn't matter the color of their skin, uh, what country they come from. We're to love each other. Uh, but they've told you as a school teacher, you have to che- teach critical race theory that if you study it, is bathed and founded in Marxism. Well, you, and I've had teachers tell me this, I can't teach Marxism. I, what do I do? Uh, and so you choose not to che- teach CRT. So what happens to you? They oppose you. Because how dare you oppose what we want you to do? Uh, you're a Christian. And you want to enjoy your free, freedom not to, not to receive the proverbial jab. You know what this is? Yeah, I don't want the shot. And you have all the reasons why you don't want to take the shot. Uh, but the, the power-crazed culture wants you to take the shot. And if you don't take the shot, they're going to put you in positions to make it difficult for you. And all of a sudden, you are opposed. Correct? Um, you're a Christian gym teacher who recognizes that God only created two sexes and two genders. And the chromosomal data backs up that simple premise. But the culture has bifurcated uh, sex and gender. And once they unhinged uh, gender from sexuality, then they could construct it into 100 different types of gender. And you oppose that because, well, that's not only not biblical, that's not even logical or medical. And so if you say anything about that, what happens to you? You're canceled. You're opposed. And we could go, go down through the list. Uh, you're, uh, you've just gone back to college. Uh, and you're watching your church online about some Y19. Uh, and you just, you just had your first professor in a science class who's, who's totally evolutionist, totally hostile to the faith, total atheist. And he's already taken you to task in the first week of school. And you're sitting here thinking to yourself, I've been studying Hugh Ross, another great Christian scientist, uh, astrophysicist, who tell me there's, there's reason for a God. And I'm not going to sit here and listen to this. So you raise your hand first week of class and say uh, what you need to say as a Christian thinking person. And what happens to you? You're opposed. So I just give you a few scenarios just to say it doesn't take much for you to find out how quickly you can be opposed as a Christian. So don't think that this psalm is, is not for you. Uh, if you want to live for Christ, you're going to be opposed uh, and it just comes with the turf. But how can I advance the kingdom in the world in which I live? Um, so as you look at this particular passage, the answer to the question that I pose, how to live uh, uh, a strong life and a true life uh, in tough times, uh, you must do a couple of things, number, as we're going to see in this passage. Uh, you must be in the Word of God, and you must be about the Word of God. You must be in it, reading it, studying it, praying over it, meditating on it, etc. You must be in the Word of God, and you must be about the Word of God, meaning you obey it. <laughs> so it's not just enough to know the Word of God, then you're just a really smart, it was a smart Christian, right? But if you traffic an unlived truth, then, then this leads to hypocrisy. So if, if all I ever talked about, and you never saw it in my private life, you would immediately conclude that Marty is what? Is a hypocrite. And so, it, so to live a strong true life, you must. this is what this whole chapter talks about. That's the main concept. You must be in the Word and about the Word. Uh, this is what Christians should do. So why should you be in the Word? Um, well, the Word trains your mind. Uh, the Word uh, uh, calms your heart when difficulties happen. Uh, the Word deepens your thinking about God and God's ways. I mean, it does many things like that. Uh, it also shows you, according to Hebrews 4, 11, and 12, the Word of God, as you read it and study it, shows you your sin. And then God calls you as a, as a saint to confess and repent and restore the relationship, the intimacy with Jesus. Uh, that's why you should be in the Word. Uh, just some of the reasons. That's not exhaustive. And then why should you be about obedience? Uh, well, um, James chapter 1, verse 22, uh, and most Christians know this, uh, James says, uh, you must be a doer of the word, right? Not just a hearer. Uh, I think uh, the world is full of a lot of hearers, but, but how many doers? I mean, you actually go out and do the word of God. So when you obey the word of God, it transforms your life, and you are then transformed in the likeness of Christ, uh, and this is the face that God shines on. So that's what the whole psalm is about as we're looking at how to live a, a strong life in a tough time. Um, there's many other principles that we could unearth, but we're not going to get to all of them, as I said, so we'll skip some of them. So what do we do uh, as, as a Christian in, in hostile times? So uh, two motifs we'll talk about today that support that opening premise. Number one, the Lord shows you how to stay undefiled because your world wants you to be defiled because if you're not defiled, you bother them. <laughs> um, when I was, uh, after my first year of college, I came home uh, to El Centro, California, uh, needed a job. Uh, I got a job at a grocery store that my friend's dad uh, managed. 
uh, two ten an hour. I was I was raking in the money. <laughs> And, and one of my friends that was going to dental, dental school, uh, Loma Linda University in LA, and so he came to me and said, hey man, I'm leaving. I gotta, I gotta leave my icing truck uh, for icing cantaloupe at a, a cantaloupe plant in a railroad yard. Uh, uh, and it pays a, like a minimum of $600 a week. You want it? I'll make you the foreman. 600 a week? I was making 210 an hour? Are you kidding me? I'll do it. So I did it. Um, it was amazing. But <laughs> I worked in a railroad yard with longshoremen and they did drugs all day because we worked 12 hours a day, sometimes more. Uh, and it was like 110 degrees, 120 degrees in the Imperial Valley where I grew up. Uh, it, it was pretty apparent that I was not a Christian. And they found out that I didn't stop for beer breaks with them. I didn't do any of the bennies. I didn't the goofballs, all the stuff that they did. I, I didn't smoke the pot that they smoked you know, on breaks. And stuff. I didn't do what they did because that's what they did. Uh, when, even my worker dropped acid before we came to work. No, I'm, these, these were my friends. I mean, the guys I grew, you know, I'm around these kind of people, and my dad's a federal agent. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, they were always harassing me, you know, to do what they do. You know, hey, man, one, one toke won't hurt. One beer won't hurt. Just a bud. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, drop one goofball. Just one. I mean, what, are you kidding me? There's no way. Um, and so they were constantly, constantly harassing me. Why? My life bothered them. Right? And not that I was trying to bother them. It's just the fact that if you're a Christian in a godless environment, they'll get, they'll get hostile because you're not defiled like them. Because once you get defiled, then they feel better about themselves. So let's get into the text. Because I wasn't planning on talking about that. that was extra I threw in. <laughs> Stuff hits you while you're preaching. You know what I'm saying? So I apologize. Um, <laughs> huh? That's true. Okay. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 1. We finally made it. You feel good? We're there. So how blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord? How blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who, who seek him with all of their heart? They, are, they also do no unrighteousness. They walk in his ways. Thou hast ordained thy precepts that we should keep them, how? Occasionally. No, diligently. So if you can't see that you're supposed to be in the word and about the word from what I just said in those verses... I, I'm not going to repeat it again because that's exactly what it says there that you need to do. So remember, Aleph is the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So the very first word in the Hebrew text is the word blessed. Uh, it's not a verb. So that means it's out of normal order. So reading from right to left uh, in, in Hebrew, the very first word is not a verb, which it's supposed to be. It's the word blessed, which means it's totally emphatic. So it starts with an emphasis that, oh, you want to lead a blessed life in tough times? Well, then what do you need to do? He tells you. I mean, if you want to live a happy, joyous life, especially in tough times, what does he say you need to do? He just told you what you need to do. Live an undefiled life. Live a holy life. And you'll leave a, lead a blessed life. Well, how do, how do, how do I do that? A morally uh, blameless life. Um, he says, well, you must walk in the law of the Lord, which means by definition, you should know the law of the Lord. So the law of the Lord is going to be the Pentateuch. From the Old Testament perspective. So if you're talking to an Israelite of the day and time, they would say, oh, that's the Pentateuch. Penta in Greek meaning five, tuk meaning law. The first five books of the Old Testament are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You want to live a blessed life? Understand those books and live those principles. So, you know, try to fulfill the, the big 10 commandments and the other 614 additional commandments. I mean, give that a shot. Yeah. Uh, aren't you glad Jesus came along and fulfilled the law for you? <laughs> But that doesn't mean that the law is abrogated because Jesus fulfilled it. Many components of the law transcend time. So he tells us uh, you must be in the word of God and you must obey the word of God to be blessed. So from the Old Testament perspective, that was understanding the Pentateuch. Uh, from the New Testament perspective, because Revelation has been progressive, that means now, you know, whatever is commanded in the New Testament from the pen of Peter, Paul, um, almost said Mary, uh, <laughs> John, you know, John Mark, who wrote, you know, as well as amanuensis for Peter, etc. So at, when you come across a New Testament command, you must be thinking to yourself, I need to do that. Why? Because that leads to a blessed life. And so uh, happy is the one who listens to the word of God as they study it, and they decide to live that light as a light where they are. Um, so if you live as light among those who embrace darkness, it by definition poses a problem uh, because you are a... You are a <laughs> A check on their system because they know their system is dark 
And all of a sudden, your life is bringing light to them. Like me as a young guy, 18 years old, working on a dock with all these longshoremen. It just, it just by definition causes a problem. Uh, and they, then they, they're going, I know, well, why don't you do what we do? Because I know Christ. What does that mean? Well, that means there's things I morally will do and things I morally won't do. Uh, one time uh, on a break, they had a huge circle of all the longshoremen. Uh, and they passed a joint around the entire circle. And I'm like, oh, no. Because the pressure is for me to do what? One smoke and pass it on. And these guys are all twice my size. Uh, and uh, so it got to me, and I, I said, hey, I'll pass on that, man. We're sitting there Indian style. They're like, what's up with you, man? I'm like, I don't do that. Why not? I just, I don't do that. As a Christian, I don't do that. Um, and they're like, hey, man, come on. I mean, be part of us. I don't do that. I am part of you, but I'm not doing that. And then one guy asked me, I kid you not, one guy asked me, hey, man, what's your old man do for a living? <laughs> uh, my dad's the head federal agent of the border. The guy almost smoked his joint that was sitting next to me. I mean, he almost swallowed it. I mean, like, yeah, I won't tell you what he said. Um, it was really funny. But, you know, so God gives you an opportunity when you want to live an, un an undefiled life in a tough environment, you know, and, and they eventually respected me. And I got opportunities to, sh to share with them and to pray with them and things like that. But, you know, uh, you, you, to lead, lead a blessed life, you have to be in the word and of the word because the word tells you what is sin, correct? The word tells you what is sin. And once I know what sin is, then I know what I'm not supposed to do. Then I don't do that. That's what the word of, word of God does. It tells me what is morally right. Now, in the world in which you live, since truth is relative to the world, they have truths, but no truth. And their truths constantly change. I mean, you, they're like, uh, that's bogey that's constantly moving. Uh, and so for them, you know, you know what was sexual sin, you know, 20 years ago? Not today. In fact, we've codified what that is. That's, it's not simple anymore. So that's where they're at. And enter you who, no, no, that, that's always sin. Because uh, the Word of God tells you what sin is, and it protects you. Uh, I read a story this week. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, in, in Texas, in Texas, um, two young men, uh, two in the morning, approached a drawbridge. Uh, it was the Black Bayou drawbridge in Texas. Uh, and it was two in the morning, so it's pitch black. And they saw the bridge go up, and they saw the security gate come down, and they thought to themselves, hey, man, we, we're going to go right through that thing and jump across the open bridge, just like in the movies, to the other side. Yeah, they were in a Chevy Cruze. <laughs> First mistake. They raised the security gate. The bridge is up. The boat's coming. They floored the little Chevy Cruze. Whew. Think they made it? No, didn't make it. Didn't make it. Uh, they didn't find them until the next day. Submerged vehicle, two young men entered glory. I wonder if they were ready. Because of a dumb decision, correct? I mean, don't tell me, don't sit there and go, that's really dumb. Didn't you do dumb things when you were young? They did. They raised the security gate. And when I read that story, I thought, that is my culture. My culture raises security gates God put down long ago, and they raise it and think, this is progressive. And God goes, no, that's digressive. It ends in death. And they constantly raise the gate. And what does the word of God say? No, those things are sinful. And the security gate of the law is down to protect you. And constantly do they raise the gate. The wise man, the wise woman keeps the gate down and says, no, it's wise to wait for the boat to go by and the rich to go down because we're in a Chevy Cruze, etc." <laughs> So it's a metaphor of our culture. Um, verse 9, he says, this is a great question for young people uh, living in tough times. How can a young man keep his way pure? Boy, isn't that the question. Uh, how do you do it? Uh, by keeping it according to thy word, with all thy heart I have sought thee. Do not let me wonder from thy commandments. Thy word have I treasured in my heart. I think the King James says hidden in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. So verse 9 is the question of, of a saint. How can, I, how can I live a pure life? I mean, until I appear before Christ. I mean, and I think about this all the time as I, as I get older. How can, I, how can I run well in life and how can I finish well? Isn't that the, isn't that the case? How can I run well on a daily on living? And then how, when I get to the end of my life, can I stand before God and say, Lord, you know, I, I kept the faith like Paul. You know, I mean, who doesn't want to live like that? Well, how do you do that? It's really hard as a young person, isn't it? Because you're young and you think you're smarter than your parents, correct? Oh my, uh, I have done a lot of things I wish I would have not have done. In fact, my mother is here this morning. Uh, she will tell you that in the I don't know, 30 years she's heard me preach over the years, uh, she and my dad always said after sermons, we learn more about your life 
than we ever knew about. <laughs> Why? Because you don't tell them all the facts, right? About all the stuff that you did uh, that could have like got you killed or got a disease or something. I mean, you didn't tell them all that stuff because you're young. So notice what he says. How can a young man keep his way pure in tough times? Well, uh, you, you keep the word of God. You hide it in your heart so you don't sin against God. Because when you're young, uh, there's so many temptations. There's sexual temptations. I mean, there just are. Uh, there's sexual temptations. Um, the carnal crowd wanting you to go along with them. Been there, done that. Um, all my friends partied. I played sports. I never went to one party. Uh, one of my friends snapped his spine at a party after he got drunk and flipped his car. Uh, his dad was Border Patrol. My dad was U.S. Customs. I knew him very well, Mike Filchin. Uh, became a Christian from that. Uh, but I learned from Mike's tragedy, I don't party with you guys because Mike can't walk anymore. You know, I, I took note as a young man. But yeah, so, you know, you, you have all these temptations, uh, but you can make it. it. You might not fit in, but, but that's okay. I can still play first string and not party with you guys. Uh, but the, the constant temptations. And so he says, if you want to keep your way pure, well, then um, hide the word of God in your heart. Well, what does that mean? Uh, Dr. Alan Ross, who taught me Hebrew at Dallas Seminary, uh, defines that word this way. It says, the verb has been traditionally translated hidden, like in the King James. But it uh, has more of a sense of to be laid up or stored up or treasured, indicating that it is so valuable it will be preserved in the heart that is in the mind for an, its appropriate use. The psalmist has done this so that the word will be continually at his disposal, disposal to determine his actions. He was such a wise professor. What was he saying? Well, the Word of God is not something like hidden. No, it's like you put it in your heart, you treasure it. It's like making a deposit in the bank, uh, and then at the appropriate times, you get to make a withdrawal because you totally need it when you're being tempted. And when you are tempted, then that Word of God pops out, and you're like, God, the Spirit of God speaks in your mind, doesn't he? Sure you want to do that? Sure you want to be with him? Remember what you memorized, etc. cetera. Uh, two years ago, I bought a, a, a Volvo XC90 uh, a new one, and it has on the dash, um, it's like an I iPad built into the dash. Still don't even really know what it's all about, but, uh, but I do know that the, the manual, I was looking all over for the car for the manual for this car. Where's the manual? Because I have an issue. I don't know how to, you know, do certain things with the car. And it's in, it's in there. Well, how do I access it? I had to go to the dealership to have them show me. You know, a young guy comes out, beep, 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 beep. I'm like, boom, there it is. Uh, this is a spiritual opportunity for instruction, is it not? Just your vehicle with, with, the, with, the, with the manual in the dash. Because if you've got an issue with your car, it's already built in. It's hidden in there. It's stored in there. It's treasured in there. All you've got to go in is type in the alphabetical letter, and boom, out it pops. Answer. That's just like the Word of God, isn't it? You hid it in your heart. You treasured it. It's like the manual for life, and you're facing a temptation. And God says, mm, remember what you read? And he brings it to mind. And then you have a will to either obey or not obey. So think about yourself uh, as a Christian. Should you, as a Christian, hang around a lot of non-Christian people if your faith isn't strong? Is that a wise thing to do? Uh, Proverbs chapter 1, if you memorize this, here's what Proverbs 1 says. My son, or son if sinners entice you, uh, don't consent, translate, don't go with them. Uh, come with us, they say. Let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, even whole as they go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious wealth. No, they won't. We'll fill our houses with spoil. Translate, it's going to be awesome what we're going to do together. He says, throw in your lot with us and we, we will have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from the path, their path. Their feet run to evil and they hasten to shed blood. Indeed, it is useless to spread the net in, in the eyes in front of a bird. No kidding. But they lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush their own lives. It's kind of lex talionis. What goes around comes around. Like if you hang around non-Christian friends, the probability of you, you becoming non, you know, godless in your actions are great, correct? And not that you shouldn't. I mean, I, I had lots of non-Christian friends. But my faith was strong. But you, know, you, know, you got to be very careful, like, who you're hanging with. Because the, uh, 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 the author of Proverbs, uh, Solomon, tells you, uh, godless friends can influence your, uh, your behavior if you're not wise. Um, years ago, I had a, a young man in my church, very smart academically, tested into the Navy program for nuclear submarines. Went to a special school, was told when he graduates, they'll give him $80,000, make him an officer, all this stuff. He, the whole world was before him. He called me one day when I was mowing my lawn. Shocking, I know. I was mowing. Got a phone call. 
And I said, hey, what's up? He goes, yeah, I'm, I'm in uh, school, uh, you know, nuclear engineering school. Uh, and I, just, I have a, a moral question. Okay, what is it? He said, uh, uh, all, on the weekends when we get leave, everybody goes and parties at a bar near the base. Should I, should I go to be the designated driver, to be the DD? No. Why'd you say that, Pastor? Because I know you. And you're, you're easily led by people. Don't, don't, don't do that. You know, but suppose somebody gets hurt. Uh, it's not on you. Uh, you shouldn't be in that environment. Oh, okay, thanks. Click. Think he listened to me? No. No. Uh, he went to be the designated driver, all right. I call it the designated drinker. Uh, he went and he drank, uh, had all kinds of issues. Eventually, Navy washed him out of the program. Last time I saw him before I moved here, uh, he was flipping burgers at the local bowling alley. Sad. It was sad. Sad. Because he had not listened to the Spirit telling him, Proverbs 1, connect the dots. So if you want to live a, 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 a powerful life in a godless time, uh, be, be in the word and be of the word, be obeying that word, and then God will make you a great witness uh, to those people that you're around. Uh, and then lastly, uh, you should uh, understand that the word gives a precise insight. Boy, does it. Uh, Psalm 119, verses 17 and 18 and verse 24 says this. Uh, he says, deal bountifully with thy servant. Why? That I might live and keep thy word. Open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things from thy law. I am a stranger in the earth. Don't hide your commandments from me. My soul is crushed with longing after the, thine, under thine ordinances at all times. Uh, my, thy testimonies also are my delight. They are my, what? Counselors. Translated, he says, Lord, I love your word so much, but there's so much if I don't understand and I have to come to you at times in stress and difficulty and ask you, could you teach me what that means? Or could you help me and understand that? Um, he says, your, the, you, your word is like, it's like a counselor sitting next to me. I mean, like, if I have questions, who do I call? You know, well, I call God, first and foremost. And when I look at something I don't understand, look, could you, Lord, could you teach me that? What does that mean? And I understand how these two conflicting things go together. Could you help me have a deeper insight into that? He's telling him, God, I'm, I'm living in a tough time. I'm being attacked for my faith. I don't understand why I'm being attacked. I don't understand why they're saying what they're saying. Could, could you help me understand what, what's going on in my life and connect the dots? Um, when I was a pastor in my 30s experiencing great opposition in California, uh, I was having a really hard time. Uh, and I was kind of uh, complaining to God. You ever done this? complaining, why is this happening to me? Why are people so mean? Blah, blah, blah. One day I was reading uh, the word of God, Jeremiah chapter 12, verse five says this. <laughs> if you, I'm going to insert my name, Marty, or you put your name in there, have run with the footmen and they've tired you out. How can you compete with the horses? If you fall down in the land of peace, how do you know, how, how, how will you do in the thicket of the Jordan? What in the world does that mean? Well, Here's Jeremiah living in a, in a completely compromised culture. They're totally antagonistic to his faith. And this is what was happening to me as a Christian in California. And you're being opposed for being a Christian in a, in a very tough environment. What, what was I complaining about? God, you, you're, it's too hard. And God told me, I mean, the Holy Spirit came and just kind of slapped me upside the head, said Marty. And let me give you a proposition. If you think this is hard and you won't learn from it, I got bigger opposition for you. This is preparing you for that over there. Do you want bigger responsibility to handle opposition at a bigger level, level over here, or do you want to just blow it over here? Uh, when I played sports, uh, one of the things that the coach drilled into our brains was uh, a concept that you, you, you all understand. Um, when the, the going gets tough, do you know this? It's not in the Bible, but what is it? When the, when, the tough, yeah, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And I'm like, man, Lord, I will never in my lifetime question you on that one. When, the tough, when it gets tough, I, I, I will ask for insight, and I'll stand on my post. I close with a, a man named Hassan John. Hassan is a Christian pastor in Nigeria. Uh, he's regarded uh, by uh, Boko Haram as, a, as an extremist. Go figure. He's an extremist. They hate him because he preaches the word of God. They put a bounty on his head of $800. Anyone that will kill this pastor who preaches the word of God. So he goes to church each day, preaches every week, not knowing if Boko Haram is going to come in and kill him and his parishioners. That's how he goes to church. 
He's seen all kinds of violence against Christians. Uh, he has not stopped preaching and teaching the Word of God. What a brave man. Why? Because he's connected the dots. He lives in a hostile environment. He's got wisdom on how he's supposed to function. So what has he done? Uh, he, he stepped out and helped a small Muslim girl who couldn't go to school after her, her father was killed in violence. So he reached out to her and helped her get to school. Then he started reaching out to other orphaned Muslim children, helping them get to school. Next thing he knew, he was helping uh, 12 Muslim women and then 120 Muslim women uh, who were widows. Helped them, reached them, uh, ministered to them. And next thing he knew, Muslim men started showing up at his house, uh, wanting help and assistance. Uh, then he actually started sitting down and eating meals with Muslims, which is, uh, well, here's how he explains that. He says, in Nigeria, that is a big thing. You don't eat with your enemy because you're afraid that he's going to poison you. <laughs> he says uh, he did all this to, uh, to show his, his love and his care and his compassion for them. That's a brave thing, is it not? What did he do? He was in a hostile environment. He connected the dots of the scriptures. He's commanded to love, to reach out, to help everyone, no matter who they are. Uh, that is a wise man fulfilling Psalm 119. Is that me? Is that you? That's who we need to be. Uh, I'll leave you with a commitment to make to God. Here's the commitment to pray to God. One sentence. Lord, I will be in the word and I will be of the word no matter what. Do you hear me? It's your commitment to God. Lord, I will be what? I'll be in the word and I'm going to be of the word no matter what. Let's pray. God, help us to fill that little uh, statement so that we can uh, have a great impact on those in our, our lives who don't know you. Uh, who desperately need to know you. And may we be the light and source of truth to them to point them to the Christ. In Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Uh, have a wonderful uh, morning, brunch, or whatever it is that you're doing.